We're glad you're here, and, and I hope that you feel welcome. I hope that you feel part of the family uh, whenever you visit with us. Last week, Brian unpacked verses 3 through 16 of chapter 5, where Paul had quite a bit to say about family matters. And Brian mentioned Steve Urkel from Family Matters and Archie Bunker from All in the Family. But I hope you noticed that Brian's take on family was quite different from either one of those illustrious and, and learned people. The passage he walked us through last week had mostly to do with widows, but as you might have expected, Brian talked about more than just widows as he took that passage apart. He discussed with us what, uh, what Paul had to say to Timothy. Brian reminded us that God takes widows, and he takes them very seriously, he takes care of them, and he even honors them as we, we walk through that passage. And now God expects us to take the same kind of care of widows and other groups who may be in need in our church. But when it comes to widows specifically, keep in mind that there were more widows in the church during the first century than there are generally today. And I say that because the followers of Jesus those, uh, during those days were, were facing intense persecution. The churches were surrounded on every side by people who had hated Jesus and now continued to hate those who, who continued to follow him. And, and knowing Paul's background early in his life, we can be sure that Paul left behind more than one widow as he pressed to have her husband arrested, imprisoned, and, and sometimes even killed because of her husband's decision to follow Jesus. In fact, I, I think it's likely that there were even people right there in Ephesus where Timothy was when he received this letter. There were people there in the church at Ephesus who had suffered under Paul's hand as Paul led violent men from place to place persecuting the followers of Jesus. Now, all of that happened before Paul began to follow Jesus, and we do know that Paul persecuted the followers of Jesus in good faith, and, and that's no excuse for what he was doing, but Paul was not motivated by prejudice or, or even hatred. Instel, instead, Paul persecuted the followers of Jesus in an effort to keep Judaism pure. Paul knew that the followers of Jesus were drawing people away from Judaism, and Paul believed that that was something that, that just needed to stop. And that's why he promoted getting rid of as many Jesus followers as he possibly could. Of course, all of that came to a crashing halt, on the day when Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. You may remember the story of that, of that day. I'm not going to tell it, but Paul met G he, Jesus appeared as an incredibly bright light and spoke to Paul. Jesus asked Paul, who at that time went by the name of Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? Which, of course, prompted Paul to say, well, who are you, Lord? And the light spoke again and said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Three days later, Paul himself became a follower of Jesus in the course of meeting with Ananias. And as you can be, and, and you can be sure, that knowing the apostle Paul and understanding his heart, you can be sure that he lived with deep regret uh, that might have bubbled to the surface from time to time whenever he met, ran into someone who had been impacted by the efforts that he made to destroy the followers of Jesus. Paul talks about that in Galatians 1, 21 to 24. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia, Paul writes. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. All that to say, it, it might have been that some of the widows in the church there at Ephesus had lost their husbands because of the persecution that Paul had instigated there in Ephesus. And that's why it's likely that there were more widows in the first century church than there tend to be today. Besides, it's clear from our knowledge of history that there are more government programs in place today uh, than there were back then. Programs that are geared toward helping widows and taking care of widows and helping, people, helping them to overcome some of the natural hardships that come their way as a result of having lost their husbands. So having said that, I have to say that I appreciate the way that, that Brian explained that Paul is not recommending a program that that our church should put in place, nor is he sharing a formula for benevolence in our church and our community. Paul singles out widows because widows were a pressing problem there in that first century church, wherever the, the followers of Jesus gathered. But, but Paul doesn't want anyone to be overlooked uh, 
whenever there's someone that's facing genuine need in our midst or in our community. You may remember that Brian pointed out that though what Paul wrote to, uh, through what Paul wrote to Timothy, that, that God called us to honor widows. That was the first thing. God called us to help families to honor their own widows, and God called us to be wise in our approach to meeting the needs that, that, that widows might have. You may remember that, Paul, that Brian helped us to see that Paul made a difference between those who are widows and those who are widows in need, or as some translations put it, widows indeed. And Paul distinguished between those two different kinds of widows by saying that some widows have families that can take care of them, that could, that could take care of them. And in cases like that, it's the children and grandchildren who should make sure that their mom or their grandma is taken care of when, uh, when she's lost her husband. And, and Paul spoke of that as a no-brainer. We ought to take care of those who take care of us. And, and just to reinforce that, I can say that I have a friend in Birmingham who is a true Southern gentleman. He and his wife are, are about the same age that Faith and I are. And I remember one day when our family was visiting with them, uh, when they had teenagers. They had teenagers and we had teenagers and we're all gathered around this big table. I'll call my friend John because, well, that's his name. But I, I remember a day when one day that we were sitting around that table together, Sunday afternoon, we're having lunch, and, 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 I, and uh, his mom called. <laughs> he had to get up from the dinner table to go and answer the phone, and it was his mom, and she was explaining to him that there were a few things that she needed him to do. Well, her, John's dad by that time had, had passed away, and, and so his mom was really truly alone in a very large house, and and uh, we couldn't hear the entire, we couldn't hear her side of the conversation, but we could hear John's. He was just kind of around the corner in the other room. And uh, we only, so we only heard his side. He talked to his mom. He was very respectful, called her ma'am, which is very common down there. But he ended the conversation by saying that, that uh, he'd be right over after dinner to help her do the things that she was asking him to do. His teenage kids were quite peeved with him when he came back to the table and sat down. Because we had plans for that afternoon and things that we were going to do, and, and uh, they, uh, John looked at me and said, Jay, you know, would you be one? I said, absolutely, you know, let's go help your mom. And uh, they were, they were kind of peeved because we had other plans, and now he was trying to add something just because his mom said that. And, and, I, and I'll never forget him sitting there at that table and saying, not kids, my mom watched over me, and she took care of me as I was during all those years when I was coming up, and, and now she needs me to watch out for her and to take care of her. And, and I want you to know that I'm glad to do it because I love her and because I owe that to her. Years later, I was sitting down with just John, and we were having a cup of coffee, all our kids grown up, and, and I reminded him of that day, and he looked a little puzzled as he as I uh, told him the story of what had happened that afternoon around that table. And uh, the reason that he looked puzzled is that he honestly couldn't remember that particular conversation with his mom. And I smiled to myself at the notion of this very important man being so accustomed to helping his mom during that time that he had no recollection of one specific time when it became necessary, a time when he was so kind. But to me, that's a great example and reminder of those people who are part of our family but are in difficulties due to circumstances beyond their control. And of course, if there are government programs that, or other things that, that that family member is able to take advantage of and, and they really don't need your help, then by all means, get them plugged in to a program that can help them and help them sort things out and to relieve the pressure that they're under. But... If we do have family members who are not able to care for themselves, then we owe it to them to help them. Or at the very least, to help them find a way uh, to take care of themselves. After all, you remember, may remember that back when we studied James together, we ran into something that, had to, that James had to say about doing the right thing. It's right up there on the screen. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. That's one of the definitions of sin. Knowing the right thing to do and not doing it is actually sin. So, all that to say that as Brian pointed out, if you have widows that are part of your family, please make sure that they're cared for. And if you are here this morning and you are a widow or you're listening, you're, you're a widow and you have no one to take care of you, 
let the church know so that we can take the steps that are necessary, the steps that we're able to take to help you. And as Brian pointed out, let's make sure that we're being wise as we put programs into place to help those who are in need. Benevolence is one of the trickiest things that the church does. It's one of the things that is most difficult to get right. So pray for the elders as you think of it and and make a point of praying for the elders even when you're not thinking about it because because they're trying to work out who is genuinely in need, how best to help those people who are in need, and when to apply that need. And, uh, And as we go... Keep in mind that, that uh, well, widows may well be a more manageable problem today than they were back then, but the principles that Paul taught Timothy in that short passage can still be specifically and broadly applied to church life today. Don't get stuck on the fact that well, there's no widows in my family. There may be others that, that they've been foolish or careless or they're just, they've been sick and are unable to keep up. And, if that's the case, then, then make sure that you, you reach out as you're able. Don't put yourself under pressure, but reach out as you're able. And as we draw this review to a close, I, I want us to remember that one of the key things that, that Brian drew to our attention last week is that the church really is a family. Archie Bunker and Steve Urkel aside, the church really is a family, and as Brian reminded us, that the fact that the fact that the church is a family can be a real blessing, but it can also be a not so blessing. I, I was reminded of these last of that these last two weeks when I stayed in Andy and Bethany's home while I was over there in the Philippines uh, before and after the conference there in the Chinese church where I was speaking. They have a plaque on the wall that says, "Families are like fudge, mostly sweet with a few nuts." Now, you may be saying, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think we have any nuts in, in our family, but if you're saying that this morning, I think it's highly likely that you're saying that because you're the nut, and, and people are just too embarrassed, to, I don't know, of you uh, to, to talk to you about it, but uh, no one wants to tell you that. But now I'm not, I'm not going to tell you who it is in our family that makes it onto the sweet list, um, and, and the reason that I'm not going to tell you that is because I, I don't want to tell you which list I'm on. <laughs> but you can probably guess. But what we've said about family is also true of our church. We have mostly sweet people here, but you know as well as I do that we also have a few nuts. And I refuse to say which of those two lists I'm on here at the church, and I refuse to say that on the grounds that it, well, it may incriminate me. But as we know, but we know that so far in, in, in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, Paul's told us, um, that we should not rebuke one another harshly. That, that happened in those first two verses. And, and that we should choose to respect one another as though we're all part of the same family. That was Paul's instruction. That was Paul's wishes. Paul also told us that we should take care of one another whenever we know someone in our midst who's in need, but who is, for one reason or another, unable to take care of themselves. So Paul's been telling us about how to interact with one another. And this week... Paul's going to talk to us about how we should interact with our elders, uh, the men who have accepted the responsibility and been ordained to watch over our souls, as as one author in the New Testament put it. And as we take the time to unpack this passage for this morning, I want to remind you of a related context uh, that we ran into when we studied Hebrews together. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority, because they keep watch over you as those who must, who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. The elders in our church have the responsibility of keeping watch over us, and they will give an account to God for the way they impacted and interacted with us during their ministry. So the author of Hebrews tells us to interact with them in a way that would bring them joy instead of burdening them by living in a reckless way. Paul will have more to say about this very idea this morning, and he'll help us to understand how we should interact with the elders who lead our church. And having said that, let's take a couple of minutes to stand and read aloud together from the passage for this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 to 21 says, The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, 
especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sitting, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Thank you. You can be seated. Thankful for the truth that we've just read. This passage, as you can see, is a, is a mouthful. And uh, the only thing that I can think to do right now is to tell you a story from God's Word. You might have expected that. But I want to tell you a story that will set the tone for where we want to go with this passage this morning. And the story that I want to tell you this morning comes from the book of First Samuel. And it, it tells us about a, a pivot point, a pivotal point, but really totally a pivot point in the reign of Saul, the first king of Israel. Saul had been anointed king at God's instructions, but this coronation took place because Israel had demanded that God give them a king. God warned Israel that it wouldn't go well for them if he gave them a king, if they chose to be led by a man instead of being led by God, but Israel insisted that they wanted a man to lead them, not this intangible being that they couldn't see. God relented and told Samuel the prophet to proclaim Saul as king. Saul had come from the smallest of the tribes of Israel, which was the tribe of Benjamin. And, and while Saul, Saul was very tall, had literally head and shoulders over everybody else in Israel, he was a humble man who at first hid among the baggage when he knew that Samuel planned to proclaim him as king. After becoming king, Saul began to change. And he viewed himself and his place in the world in a very different way. He viewed it with pride instead of the humility he had first brought to the throne. We're not sure exactly when in Saul's reign the story that I'm about to tell you uh, this morning took place, but I think you'll see the upheaval this story will bring to Israel and the connection this story has to the passage that we'll be looking at this morning. That is at least my hope. As the story begins... Israel is once again under the boot of their old nemeses, the Philistines. Feels like every time I tell a story about Saul or David, the Philistines loom large in that picture. They were, they were a nuisance. But Israel had cried out to God, and once again, God is planning to show them mercy by delivering them from the Philistines, and God is planning to use Saul to get that done. And with that background, this is the story from God's Word from 1 Samuel chapter 13. I'd welcome you to turn there and fact check me as I go. Saul reigned over Israel for 42 years and, and this story takes place several years. We don't know exactly how many after Saul was crowned king. The Philistines, as I mentioned, were being a nuisance to Israel again and things they were on the verge of, of, of heating up and, and so Saul chose 3,000 men to join him in the army. He kept 2,000 of the men beside him, and he allowed 1,000 of the men, he ordered 1,000 of the men to follow Jonathan, his son. Jonathan, it seems, took it upon himself. We're not sure how it all went down, but it seems like he took it upon himself to attack the Philistine outpost at a place called Geba. And naturally, the Philistine king and the generals heard about what, Saul, what Jonathan had done. Saul ultimately took responsibility for the attack, and he knew that the Philistines would be, well, let's just say peeved uh, uh, for, because of what Jonathan had done. So Saul sent out word that all of the people in the Israel, all of the men in the army, should join him at a place called Gilgal. And from there, they would press an attack into the Philistine territory near Geba. Philistines got wind of Saul's plan and moved to preempt the Israelite attack by assembling the Philippi the Phil Philippine army. Yeah, no. The Philistine army there in, at a, in a town called Michmash, and presumably they were not far from where, from Gilgal, where the Israelite army, army was deployed. So just for the sake of understanding, Saul, uh, Israel had more than 3,000 men who were essentially unarmed because the Philistines had taken away all of their swords and all of their weapons. All they had was plows and plow, you know, scythe and clubs, and that was the way they were going to take care of this battle. 
The Philistines, in the meantime, had 3,000 chariots. Saul had 3,000 men. The Philistines had 3,000 chariots that were each manned by two men each. And according to the story, they had, they had warriors that were beyond, you couldn't count them. There were so many of them. Needless to say, Saul and his army understood that their situation was desperate. And so they came up with a plan to do the one thing that they, that they, th they thought might help. They decided to hide. <laughs> it's, it's not a great military strategy, but that, that's what they did. They, they hid. They hid in caves and among rocks and among thickets and in pits and in cisterns and some of them even deserted as they crossed the Jordan because they're going to hide at home, I guess. I don't know what the plan was, but the danger continued to grow for the Israelite army as more and more men ran away. This increasing danger served to prompt a reciprocal <laughs> increase in Saul's religion, so he sent word to the prophet Samuel, who was also a priest, and asked him to come quickly and offer a burnt offering and a fellowship offering before the battle began. Saul didn't have the authority to do either one of those things, and he didn't have the right to offer those sacrifices himself, so he settled in to wait until Samuel arrived. Samuel sent word back that he would be there in seven days, and we're not sure uh, for the delay. It might have been the great distance that, that he was coming. It might have been the fact that he knew he'd have to walk all the way there. He's not a young man by this point, or ride on a donkey, and, and, uh, and Saul waited an entire day. And then a second day, and a third day, and a fourth day, and a fifth day, and a sixth day, as he anticipated the seventh day when Samuel was due to arrive. But uh, by the end of the sixth day and the beginning of the seventh, Samuel was still not there. And because Samuel was not there, there was no offerings or sacrifices, and Saul began to panic, even though he should have expected Samuel to arrive that day. Now, by the seventh day, Saul's soldiers begin to defect to, to desert in even greater numbers, and, and, uh, and so Saul figured that he just couldn't wait any longer. Saul gave the order to his men to bring him the animals for the sacrifices and the, offer, and the burnt offering, uh, and, and uh, he wanted to get the show on the road. And he did that even though God's law required that a priest make that offering. Just as Saul finished offering the burnt offering, <laughs> Oh, man, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. Just as Saul finished offering the burnt offering in disregard to God, Samuel, the prophet and priest from the tribe of Levi, showed up just as he had promised. Samuel saw that Saul had completely, completely overstepped his boundaries and had violated God's law by making an, the offering on his own when he had no right. And Samuel immediately confronted Saul. What on earth... Have you done, Samuel said to Saul. Uh, well, Saul replied, I, I saw that the men were scattering, and, and I noticed that you didn't arrive on the seventh day. And of course, here it was the seventh day, and Samuel had just arrived, just like he said he would. But anyway, back to the story and to Saul's excuses. The, 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 men, the men were scattering, Saul continued. You weren't here, and, and the Philistines were increasing in numbers by the, the minute. And, and it occurred to me, Saul continued, that, uh, that the Philistines could attack in any, at any moment. And, and here I was, not having sought the Lord's favor. So I, I, I felt like I didn't have a choice but to offer the bird offering. Samuel just shook his head and said, You have done a very foolish thing because you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave to you. Samuel continued, if you had kept God's law and waited for me to make the offering, then God would have established your kingdom forever here in Israel, for all time. But since you've chosen to disobey the Lord, I can tell you right now that your kingdom will not endure. Samuel then went on to say, the Lord has chosen a man after his own heart, and he will reign in your place in Israel. Samuel concluded by saying, just to be clear, the Lord is doing this because you have not kept the Lord's command. Samuel then left Gilgal, and Saul counted the men who were still with him. And by this time, they numbered only 600. And that's the story from God's Word. Now before you say anything else, I want to say that it may seem like a very small thing, this thing that Saul did. But in God's mind, it was not a small thing. It was not a trifling matter. 
Under the Old Testament economy, it was the priests and the priests alone who had the responsibility and the privilege of leading people in worship. Saul had taken that privilege on himself. And again, it may seem like a small thing to us, but it wasn't a small thing because God made a big deal of it. In the end, Saul's foolishness and disregard to God's word and God's law cost Saul the kingdom. And this morning I want to go on record as saying that that, that thing that Saul did that day was not the stupidest thing that Saul ever did, but it certainly was in the top five, and it was the thing, it was the straw that broke the camel's back in Saul's reign. And as we look at this story, it becomes clear that priests serve because God chose them, because God allowed them to serve. And, and, and leaders lead because God chooses them and allows them to lead. Leading in worship and leading in the church are not rights that have been given to just anyone. They are privileges that are given by God himself to a few. And let's be clear, a privilege that has been given can be taken away, just like what happened to King Saul. And that means that leaders in the church can be ordained because they've qualified themselves just like Saul qualified himself in the beginning of his reign. But that also means that leaders in the church can be removed because they have disqualified themselves just like Saul disqualified himself in the story this morning. As we get into this passage this morning, I want to remind you of something. I've not been ordained as a pastor or an elder here at the Potter's House. And since I'm not ordained as an elder or a pastor here, I don't serve in that capacity. Instead, I believe that God brought faith in me here so that I could serve in the role of, a, of an evangelist in the first century church sense of the title. And that means that I'm here by God's grace to establish this church by setting things in order and order, ordaining elders who will lead the church. And that's a direct reference to Titus 1.5, as you can see there on the screen. Prior to the time when we ordained the elders, it was my job to direct the affairs of the church. But once the elders were ordained, it stopped being my job to direct the church, and the elders took that responsibility. They assumed that role. And as someone who spent his life establishing churches, I can tell you that our elders here are doing a great job in, in directing and leading in our church. And because of that, they are men who are worthy of, as Paul puts it, double honor. Look what Paul says in the first part of verse 17. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor. Now, of course, that leads, the, leads to the question, what kind of honor is Paul talking about here? Well, as Brian pointed out last week, honor here means in part exactly what you think it means. Honor. We don't we don't need to complicate it any more than that. But if synonyms help you out to help you to understand the meaning of words, here are some synonyms for the word honor. Admiration, esteem, approval, appreciation, regard, and even high regard. So at first blush, it's clear that Paul's telling us that we should highly regard and respect the elders in our church who serve well. But as we look further in this passage, it's clear that Paul is talking about more than how we feel about the elders, and especially the elders who work hard in preaching and teaching. Now, I've been asked to speak in some churches, and, and I, I, I mean this literally. This I'm not making this up. I've been asked to speak in some churches where the leadership has come up to me before I spoke and asked me to talk to the church about their giving. Literally. They've invited me in to speak, and I'm supposed to be the one who talks to them about their giving. The church leadership in those cases wanted to be clear that, that they didn't want to badger the people about, you know, about their giving. And, uh, but as an outsider, they felt that it would be more appropriate for me to be the one to talk to the church about how much they were putting in the offering. So because the leaders of the church were confusing the word missionary with the word mercenary, I'd become a paid hitman, a hired gun with the job of attacking the congregation on behalf of the church leadership. And I can tell you, that is not my favorite thing to do when I've been invited somewhere to speak. And I can also tell you that what I'm about to say here this morning has not been prompted by the elders. They have not asked me to talk about this. It's actually the Apostle Paul who asked me to talk about this because that's the part of 1 Timothy we're at. That's part of teaching expositionally. We don't get to decide 
well, we don't want to talk about this particular passage this week. Believe me, I would have avoided it if I could. Still, I am a bit of an outsider here because Paul's going to talk about how we should honor the elders who lead and whose job it is to preach and teach in the church. I say that I'm a, a bit of an outsider because while I do quite a bit of preaching and teaching here at the Potter's House, I'm technically not an elder. And that's why I said what I did a, a few minutes ago. And that means that I'm, what, I'm, what I'm about to say this morning about this double honor thing for an elder technically doesn't apply to me. And that might mean that I can speak about this double honor thing in a slightly more detached way. So with that said, I'll just go ahead and say it. When Paul talks about the elders being worthy of double honor, he's talking about treating them with respect, but he's also talking about paying them twice as much. Oh, wow. Okay, well, let's just keep going here. You haven't, you haven't chosen it. I say that because Paul quotes both Moses and Jesus when he tells Timothy to make sure to give double honor to the elders who both lead well and teach and preach well. Look at what Paul says when we add the last part of verse 17 and verse 18 to what we just read. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those, work, those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says... Do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. For sure, Paul's talking about respect in these verses, but that comment about wages makes it clear that he's also talking about money. The only thing that Paul doesn't make clear is how much honor, how much money he's talking about when he says that, that those who preach and teach are worthy of double honor. So... In an effort to understand what Paul means here, I did a little research to try to discover how much honor a gifted preacher and teacher deserves. And in my research, I found this guy right here. His name is Mark Driscoll, and he's the former pastor of the former church called Mars Hill. Now, if you've listened to Mark, you may not always have agreed with Mark Driscoll, but he is a good communicator and a very capable preacher and teacher. And even though we may not agree with him, his skill as a teacher would indicate to me that he would be one of those people, one of those preachers that's worthy of double honor. So I looked up his salary, and I discovered that during his time, the time that he was preaching and teaching at Mars Hill, he was making an annual salary of $650,000. So I concluded that if $650,000 is double honor, then we can just divide that by two and conclude that you should be teaching your, you should be paying your teaching pastors $325,000 a year. Enough said. <sighs> you done? Okay, let's take a deep breath while, uh, while I take a moment to say, I'm just kidding. I, I really am. I don't mean that at all. But you, you should have seen your faces. That was good. Now, Mark Driscoll's salary may seem huge, but it's within the range that a senior pastor of a mega church makes in a year. It's very common for a senior pastor in a mega church to make that much money. So I have to ask myself, are the administrators of those mega churches willing to pay that much because they believe that Mark Driscoll and their, their senior pastor is worth that much? They don't want to double honor their senior pastor? Or is it more likely that the administration of those mega churches is willing to pay that much because they know that if they don't pay that much, some other mega church might come along and take their senior pastor away and be willing to pay him more money? Is that what's going on? Frankly, I don't know the answer to those questions, and I don't care about the answers to those questions. I only know that that personally, I am glad to be able to say that I am honored by the privilege that you've given me to teach here. And I'm confident that Brian would say the same thing. I'm also glad to be able to say that I won't be making signs and protesting the amount of money you're giving me, and I'm confident that Brian would say the same thing. Jump up and correct me if I'm speaking on your behalf. I'm also be able, glad to be able to say that this Sunday after Thanksgiving... I'm thankful that you allow me to study God's word in that office back over there every week. 
And I'm thankful that you give me the privilege of influencing you toward godliness and leading you into the truth every Sunday that I stand behind this pulpit. So, uh, would I accept more salary if you were to offer it? <laughs> sure. I mean, we, we always accept cash, right? And I'm confident that Brian would say the same thing. But, but, is there a chance that I would leave because I don't think you're paying me enough? Absolutely not. And once again, I'm confident that Brian would say the same thing. Thank you. Thank you for the way you've taken care of my family and me over the years that we've been together. You've been a blessing to us, and I only hope that my teaching has been a blessing to you and to your family. And now, it's time to move on. We've been talking about how to respond to those elders who are doing their job well, right? But what happens when an elder makes a mess of his life and, and fails in some significant way? How should we respond when something like that happens? In other words, what does God's Word teach us about how we should respond when an elder makes a decision to live in a way that is inconsistent with the way that God's Word requires an elder to live? Well, the answer to that question is fairly simple, and it begins by remembering how our elders became elders. Uh, you already know how they became elders if you spent any time at all listening to the teaching here at uh, the Potter's House between May 1st and September 4th. And I picked those two dates in particular because for that entire time we talked about the qualifications of deacons and elders. And during that time we made it very clear that no person, no person could be ordained as a deacon or an elder in our church unless they meet the qualifications of deacons and elders that Paul listed for Timothy in chapter 3. And in that light, whenever we've ordained a deacon or an elder, we've listed the qualifications of a deacon or an elder on one side, and, and then we've listed the names of those who have been nominated on the other side of the screen. And then we ask you as a church to weigh in to help us to know if the list of qualifications matches the character of the men who are men and women who are named on the other side of the screen. And, uh, and, and our elders become elders then, not because we voted for them, not because they've won some type of, of a popularity contest, but because they've proven that they're living according to the qualifications. Their character and the qualifications match, and that's why we ordain them. Those who serve as deacons and elders in our church have proven that their character matches the qualifications that the Spirit of God has given for those who will serve in that role. Now, if a man or a woman has qualified themselves to serve as a deacon, or a man has qualified himself to serve as an elder, and this is an important point, if they can qualify themselves to lead in the church, then it stands to reason that they can also disqualify themselves from leading in the church. Since they got their job by living in the way that's described in, in, in 1 Timothy 3, it follows that they can also lose their job by doing things that are other than what's described in 1 Timothy chapter 3. In other words, deacons and elders are not bulletproof. You can remove a deacon or an elder from their position by simply proving that they no longer meet the qualifications for the job. And how do you prove that they're no longer qualified to lead? Well, that's also simple. You bring witnesses. It's simple to remove a deacon or an elder from their job, and that's why <coughs> Paul has put a caveat in place to protect elders from having to, step down, from having to step down every time an accusation is brought. If there are no other witnesses, this is the caveat, if there are no other witnesses to what you say the elder has done, you should not bring that accusation against that elder because the church will not receive that accusation. Look with me at verse 19. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. It is easy to bring an accusation against an elder and have him removed from office. And because it's so easy to bring an accusation and have an elder removed, there must be protection in place for the elders who are serving in our church and other churches around the world. And that protection is simply this. 
the elders cannot remove an elder from his position, and they cannot even listen to an accusation against an elder unless two or three people agree that he did indeed do something that disqualifies him. But what happens when there are two or three people who are saying the same thing? What happens when it becomes clear that an elder has sinned and has thus disqualified himself from continuing to serve as an elder? Well, the answer to those two questions is simply put, but difficult to do. Look at verse 20. But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. If two or three witnesses prove that an elder has disqualified himself by sinning, then that elder is to be rebuked in front of the entire church so that the other elders will know that they will not escape the same fate if they choose to live in a similar way. Remember, when we looked at the qualifications of an elder, we found that an elder qualifies himself by being above reproach. Those were the t that was the term that, that Paul started with, above reproach. And so when, when an elder comes to the place after, as he's serving, that he is no longer above reproach, he is no longer qualified. And there may be some here who are thinking that this sounds kind of harsh. I know. And some may be thinking that here at the potter's house, maybe we should be gracious and so show mercy to those elders who sin. And here's where I have to say that I'm inclined to agree with you. I think we ought to cut these guys some slack because, and, and I can say this without any guile, I love every one of the men who serve as elders in our church. And I want to show them all the grace that my heart can muster in any and every situation. But there are two things that mitigate that, and one is that the elders who serve here agreed to live in keeping with this principle before they were ordained. In other words, we told them that they were being ordained because they met the qualifications, and we warned them that, if they ever came to the place in their life where they are consistently living outside of those qualifications, then they would be rebuked in front of the entire church. So they knew the deal coming in. But there's more to it than that. I have to say that this thing that Paul has told us to do, this charge that Paul has given us, is the strictest, sternest charge that can be found anywhere in the New Testament. Look what Paul says in verse 21. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the holy angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. At the moment that it's been proven that an elder has chosen to, to disqualify himself from being an elder, it no longer matters how we feel about that person, about him as a person. I love all the elders, and I, I like all the elders. But at the moment that one of them disqualifies himself, we are to take action against him without sparing the ones that we like and without treating the ones we don't like unfairly. And even though I'm not an elder, listen to me, hear me loud and clear, even though I am not an elder, the same thing applies to me if I disqualify myself from the role that I play here. And so... Uh, as we decide to take action or not take action, we must be aware that God, Jesus, and the holy angels are all holding us accountable as a church. In other words, we cannot decide not to do the right thing no matter what the elder has done or who it is that's brought the accusation. We cannot decide to not take action no matter how well we like the elder who has been accused or how much we dislike the one who has brought the accusation. The purity of the church is at stake at times like that. And when the purity of the church is at stake, the purity of the gospel is at stake at well, is at, as well. And when the church and the gospel are at stake, we must do the right thing. And we must do the right thing without showing partiality or favoritism. Paul will have more to say about how we should react and relate to the elders in the church. But for now... For the sake of reminding you what we've learned this morning, I want to read the passage to you one more time. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wage. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder, 
unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you're to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Well, it's been a uh, dark and difficult way to end this message. So can I make a suggestion? If one of the elders here in our church has been helpful to you or has been a blessing to you and your family, why not just take a moment at the end of church to let them know that? Honor them for the role that God has allowed them to play in your life. Will you stand with me in the presence? Our Father and our God, we bow before you as a holy God. A God who has called upon us to be holy because you are holy. God, we've said some really hard things this morning and, and walked through some very difficult passages. And, and God, we don't want to come away as being too harsh. But we do know that, that you treasure the church. You treasure the gospel. And God, when those things come into jeopardy because of, of life choices that we make, we know, God, that you're, you want that dealt with. We know that you're a God of mercy, and we know that you're a God of grace. And God, I, I pray that you would help each one here this morning to know and understand that for all these years that we've had elders, we have been living under this principle. And it has never backfired. So God, we're going to continue doing this, but, but Father, we pray that you would help us to, to understand the weight that the elders carry here in our midst and be willing to honor them, to respect them, to hold them in esteem. And, well, God, to say that when the opportunity comes along. Move us to encourage them, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen and amen.